Hey there, everybody. Whoa. The microphone really gets it going, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like right on the edge of even needing it. So um, thanks, first of all, to uh, David and Kara for introducing me, or for inter uh, not introducing me, for inviting me uh, to come and speak with you today. Uh, I'm Shango Los. I am the host of the Shaping Fire podcast. Um, uh, I'm also the founder of the Vashon Island Marijuana Entrepreneurs Alliance. Uh, we worked on Vashon Island to find um, new channels for product for our medical growers, which is now wrapped up, but the, uh, the organization still exists as an educational organization. Um, I'm also a former brand strategist and then CEO of Greenline Farms, and I'm a longtime Canvas business consultant um, for both medical and 502. So the point of the talk today is going to be to suggest a strategy that you can use to find a job in cannabis um, that is not the same strategy that everybody else is using. Um, one thing that, that, that works in life, but also especially works well when looking for a job, is find out what everybody else is doing and then do something else. Because everybody else is doing that one strategy, and so whatever sex, success there is to be had from that strategy is probably going to be um, taken advantage of by somebody else just simply because of the numbers. So we're going to start in a really kind of an odd place. We're going to start with, are you sure you want a job in cannabis? And, and obviously, if you're here, you're pretty sure that you do. Um, but we're going to go through this because part of the idea of the talk today is that we're going to leverage your passion for working in cannabis to get a job. And so by going through this quick little exercise, we'll, um, we'll rev up your passion a little bit, right? All right, so, so first of all, um, you know, do you really want to work in cannabis because you've got to be passionate about it? Because when it comes right down to it, working in cannabis is working at a startup. And working at startups is really hard. It's not like a normal job where you, you, know, you can punch in, you can punch out, you know when you're going to get paid, you've got some stability. We don't have any of that in the cannabis industry yet. And, and you know, we, even after 18 years, we never had that in medical ever either. And so um, you, know, you can probably expect a good five to 10 years before we get anything that looks close to stability. So let's talk for a second about the downsides or the challenges of working at a startup. You, know, you need to be the kind of person who's gonna be down with working on unexpected duties. If you're the kind of person who's like, well, you know, that's not my department, you know, working at a startup might not be for you because you are going to essentially be an employee in every department. Um, you know, you might be a grower, but some days you might need to do packaging. You might be a packager, but some days they might need you to file stuff in HR. You might be an HR person and you might end up doing deliveries. Now, if you're the kind of person who's going to be all like, I don't know what I do, well, you know, startups might not be for you because you've got to be willing to wear a lot of hats. Um, also, um, if you live so close to the bone that if you get paid a couple days late, um, you may want to have awarenesses around that, too, because so many um, 502 folk are also running so close to the bone that um, I see constantly folks are, you know, one day, three days, a week uh, late simply because their cash flow is such a drag. Now, if you're going to get a job at a highly funded company and they even have an HR person, uh, you know, the likeliness of that definitely goes down. Um, but more often than not, the 502 companies are doing everything they can on a shoestring and making their capital go as far as it can. And if they just made a big purchase so that they can process it into product, um, they may not. They may end up of uh, you know rolled the dice and lost. And they're like, oh, we don't have payroll for like five days. And you know, as an employee. You need to be willing to suck it up a little bit. Now, I don't mean let, let your company take advantage of you because you know, we are all our own company, right? And we need to defend our own you know, rights in the world. But at the same time, um, there is such thing as taking one for the team. And, and you know, having your payroll be a little late is something that happens at startups all the time. So you need to have like a little emotional flexibility on that. And then, of course, there is the hours, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of variety of the kinds of jobs in cannabis. You know, there's, there's hourly jobs, and those are pretty much, um, you know, you, you do your hours, you get paid for them, and you move on. Um, but, you know, if you get a salary position, you need to understand that there's a certain amount of that that is open-ended. 
you are paid salary for as many hours as you're needed. Now granted, you may decide that the agreement that you made with your employer is not something that you're okay with anymore, and so you decide to leave because they're asking 60 hours for 40 hours of pay, which makes your hourly wage atrocious, right? Um, but there's something to be said for sweat equity, right? You know, when I started the Vashon Island Marijuana Entrepreneurs Alliance, um, I wasn't getting paid at all, and actually I never got paid for it. But it was because I put in the time um, to make it happen that I learned the connections and got the networking done so that then I could launch the rest of my consulting career and the podcast and all this other cool stuff that's happening now. Similarly, if you're getting a job at a startup, you know, Expecting to only work 40 hours is probably a little unrealistic. You know, 50 is probably a little more realistic. And if you're the kind of person who's like, you know, it's five, I got plans, I gotta go pull some tubes, I gotta go. Yeah. You know, that's not really the kind of startup mentality. I mean, getting high is because almost everybody in the industry does. But, um, but the idea that you've got somewhere better to be is the part that I'm talking about. And if you, got, if you go into it with, like, I only wanna do my own job and I got somewhere else to be, um, <coughs> startups might not be the thing for you. So, um, also, you need to be aware that working in, working in cannabis has got some challenges. Um, for example, being judged by other people. Um, you know, a lot of people who are working in cannabis, they have to deal with, you know, what their aunt said or what their grandparents say, especially if you're hoping to get some inheritance. <laughs> and uh, I see this all the time where people have got challenges. They're all like, oh man, cannabis is my passion, but my family is like getting down on me. Or, or maybe you need to get an apartment, right? And you're applying for a new apartment and they look at your, your job and they're like, oh, I don't know this company, what is this? And you're like, cannabis industry. And they're like, nope, we don't want your kind around here. Well, they probably wouldn't say that, they just wouldn't call you back, right? But that happens. Or how about going to um, apply for a car and they find out that your income is from the cannabis industry and they don't want your filthy cannabis money um, you know, coming in to pay off your car loan. This stuff happens. I mean, um, those of us who are cannabis business owners, we're still having a hard time finding banks that will take our money anyway so we can pay you your payroll, right? So um, these kinds of challenges are all uh, doubled down as far as being a startup that's in cannabis. And then finally, there is risk involved. You know, cannabis companies go down all the time. And um, it is, uh, it's, it, it's messy, it is high risk, the regulations are changing, there's moratoriums that suddenly make um, your company illegal in the county that you're in. Um, it is a, an exceptionally high risk job. And, um, and, and then sometimes they don't even have to close, sometimes all they have to do is just reorganize. They can reorganize and decide, you know what, when we hired for this, we hired nine people. And, and you know what, we think we can do it on three, with three people. And that means that it frees up six salaries to do other things, and now we're going to go hire a bigger sales team. You can be on the low end of that. And so these are the challenges and the risks you need to be prepared for. Now, if, you're, if you heard all that and you're like, yeah, I can make all that happen, well then we get to talk about the upsides, right? Because working in cannabis is awesome. And I am uh, very lucky to have you know, lived in a time where, when I worked in the dot-com boom, they said, <clears throat> uh, you know, oh, we all have these once in a lifetime jobs. And now I've got two, I've got twice in a lifetime work, right? Because I've got two brand new industries. So if you can handle all that risk we were just talking about, well number one, you get paid to work legally with weed, which is awesome, right? It's the kind of stuff that we used to like joke about high in college, about like, someday man, and then like now we're living someday, and that's really cool. And, and so also, you know, being involved in a brand new industry, um, it's, it's titillating, and it's exciting, and you are participating in building something that hasn't existed before, and because of that, you get to put your mark on an industry. You can help make the rules, and it is not very often that you get to participate in an industry where you will be able to play a role in making the rules, and, and that in and of itself is cool, I mean, outside of your compensation package. Um, also, there is a certain advantage if you're the kind of person who likes to be on the edge to be able to work in something that's taboo, right? I mean, I, I, I like it when I tell people what I do for a living and you can kind of see, you know, you know, the people who don't immediately like ask me for a job, are the other folks are like kind of a little gassed, like, you know? And, and, and that's cool because, because I like to, you know, I like to get that reaction a little bit, you know? Um, uh, being brought up in the Midwest maybe causes that. So. Um, but also there's other really important things, like fast upward mobility. There is no other industry right now where you can move up in the ranks faster than cannabis. 
You know, I've already seen people who started a year and a half ago as a bud tender, they did a really good job, suddenly now they were like the supervising bud tender, and then, and then they were moved into the operations manager, and they were opening and closing the store, and then they got poached by another company to, to help run operations in the processing facility, and now they've got, you know, a real salary, and, and they're like, okay, well, do I want to stay here in Washington, or do I want to go to be, go where I'm being poached to come to in Nevada, right, for even more? Um, it happens fast. The, the talent pool is tiny, tiny right now. And so once you get your foot in the door, if you're doing a good job, you can expect a, a quickly upwardly mobile position. Um, also, it means that you can switch companies pretty easily. You know, there is kind of a, you know, a certain amount of glass ceiling being a bud tender because uh, there's only so many, so there's only so high to go in retail, right? But, but there's so much room for advancement for people who are already working in the industry that if you have done a good job at a bud tender, you understand the 502 rules. If you've proven that you've got management skills, um, it's it's very easy for you to jump to another company and 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 be able to move through you know a, a you know bud tender glass ceiling that way. And so there's there's a lot of this linear mobility between companies. And you know, um, managers are used to it. You know, it's it's not like other industries where they're all like, hey, "You're leaving this other company. You're just going to leave us." Well, yeah, I'm probably going to do that. But you might get two years out of me, and you need me, and I need you. So let's dance. You know, it's it's a different scene. And so, um, you know, to a certain degree, um, working in cannabis is like musical chairs, where where you know, folks who are attending this event, they're coming in, and then they're in a musical up, and then up. Again, and then and then you know the folks who come to an event like this in a year they're gonna come in because we're all new we're all new and that uh, allows for a lot more flexibility and honestly negotiation in your compensation package too and then finally I touched on this a moment but the skills you learn here in Washington can be worth mad money in another state in a very short period of time um, you know we are very lucky that we are in Washington because we can get our start here before all the other states are have even gotten out of the gate. And so it is not uncommon now for me to see people who started their uh, gig in Washington. They, uh, they were huge into learning about their job. They studied every aspect of it. They stayed after. They asked questions. They took positions of management. And, and they learned jobs that weren't theirs. And so they got a reputation for being good at it. Well, now they're being headhunted by a company in Ohio or Florida or Arkansas or you know wherever. And and uh, you know um, a friend of mine recently uh, got headhunted. Now suddenly he's in Chicago, right? He's in Chicago and he's building out five extraction facilities, and they treat him like a rock star. And you know he is a rock star. You know he's got mad skills. But you know, when he started, he was just an extractor that people respected in Washington, right? And now, you know, there are there's national news stories about his badass company in Chicago. That can be you. We are still in the early days of this industry where if you get started now, you can earn your stripes in Washington and then go to another state, um, you know, where your family lives or where you like the weather better, or you just want to explore because maybe you were you grew up in Washington. So anyway, with that. Now, we're all very firmly established the fact that we're all passionate about being in cannabis and we really want to do this. So here's the formula that I have used my entire life. Um, I actually learned this from my folks growing up and I've used it in all sorts of industries and it works really, really well in cannabis. So, so here we go. And this is the part if you're taking notes, you're gonna to wanna to take notes on. So what's the best tactic to find the way to the job you want? Choose the company that you want to work for. Don't wait for them to post a job. You know, it's important for you to answer the ads when people are asking because that's low hanging fruit. But the ad that you're responding to, thousands of other people are very likely responding to that ad as well because the company sat up and said, we're looking for folks. And I get this you know, deluge of resumes. But now you're just in with everybody else and you're not really all that special. And it makes it harder to get the job, it makes it harder to keep your job because they, well, we got them from an open call. We can you know, get somebody just like them again doing the same thing. And when it comes time to let people go, 
Um, unless you really made yourself look uh, impressive to the company, you'll be one of the first people to get rid of because you were easy, you know? And, and uh, we see that time and time again, that being able to stay at a company a long time, um, it, you can start that with day one and how you find them. So flip the, flip the script by choosing the company that you want and the job that you're interested in and then going after it. Very literally, start by making a list of 10 companies in cannabis that you want to work for, that you feel hot about, that you think they're cool, maybe their brand, maybe their product, maybe um, the kind of extraction technique they work on, maybe that they respect their employees, maybe they're into a diverse environment. Whatever it is that you feel um, is attracting you to that company, make a list of 10 of those companies. And, and I don't mean make a list of three companies, or, or you, you make a list of seven and then you kind of run out of gas. No, go through and push and find 10 companies to target because the secret is in the numbers, right? The more people you contact, the better you're increasing the likelihood that you're gonna find a job. Now, if when I said, you know, um, think about the companies that you want to work with based on what they do, right? If you're like, well, I don't know what these companies do, or I don't know why I like these companies, well, then you haven't done your homework yet. You need to do more homework. Um, these companies want to hire somebody who already has an awareness of the industry. Now, you don't have to come from cannabis, but you have to at least understand the differences between the companies, um, you know, find out who the people are behind the company, where they do business, read their website. So, so you are developing your taste in a company that you want to work for so that you can tell them why you want to be there. So after you've got this list of 10 companies, do your homework very specifically about those 10 companies. Think of each one of them as a target. I always recommend finding out who the visionary is at the company. Find out who that principal is because they're all gonna have one. They're gonna have the person who had the idea and put it together and decided that we're gonna make this happen. And it's those, those people, it's those people who will be most responsive to the resume that you're gonna send them that says, I am passionate for how you chose to do things. And if you're, if you're passionate about how you chose to do things, um, uh, you're already getting your foot in the door because they're excited. The visionary will be like, oh, he loves or she loves the decision that I made myself to, to run my company this way. And so, so that's, that's a warming up point for you. So, so then, you know, after you've done this research, you've got your 10 jobs uh, or 10 companies that you want to work for and you know who the visionary is. Now you want to write your cover letter. Because you know, we're assuming that you already have your professional experience uh, page uh, written out, and if you need help with writing a resume, you know, the good folks at Verdi and Staffing are the people to talk to. That's not really what we're talking about today. But you're going to write a cover letter that is unique for each individual company. Now, they can have the same spine. They can be similar. But you don't want to take the same one and just go, you know, 10 times send it out. You want to write that resume, the cover letter, that says why you think their company is badass, why you want to work for them, and what you think that you can add that goes along with what you respect about them. If you're an extractor, talk about what you like about their extraction, why you hold it in esteem, and what you think you can add to their team. If you are an awesome administrator or middle manager, tell them why you like how their company is run or their brand or, or even their product line that you just think they've got great pre-rolls. Whatever it is that you love about that company, write that in a letter. And you know sometimes when we write cover letters, we write them in such a way that so we sound like businessy, you know? You like clean up your language and stuff. You want to do that to a certain degree, but when you're writing a passionate cover letter, Speak from your heart, you know? You don't need to use that business narrative language all the time because if you think about it, the person who's reading it, they are in cannabis, they started their company because they're jazzed by it. Let them hear some of your excitement. Don't be shy about it. Don't, don't get rid of the jazziness in your writing voice just to sound more professional because honestly, there aren't a lot of professional folks in cannabis, and that's really not a standard that, um, that a lot of people are going by. You know, we want you to you know, you know, 
show up to work on time, we want you to know how to interact with your other employees, and we want you to be able to do your job really well. But a level of professionalism is not something that is really um, you know, a, a, a big demand in the industry just yet. And use that to your advantage. Yeah. So one thing that I learned today um, from uh, uh, Kara from Viridian Staffing during her introduction for the, for the folks that are here today, um, she mentioned don't put in your cover letters that you're a patient. And you know what, that makes a lot of sense. You know, back when um, Washington only had medical cannabis, it was important that we all put in our cover letters that we're a patient, we get patients' needs, we want to be involved in taking care of your patients. That was, that was the shtick. But now that, um, now that medical has gone away, if you put in your cover letter that you are a patient and so you identify with the needs, you're putting the uh, employer in an uncomfortable position because you're coming up against all sorts of laws that make them not be able to tell you no because you may be sick. Right. All right. New bedroom. Check. Oh. All right. So, um, so you want to not mention that you are sick and that you're using cannabis for some way. That's, that's your own business, and it's better for the employer to not know that because you know, their concern will be, well, what if we bring them in for an interview and, and they, they bomb the interview and then we say no, and then they come back to us with a suit saying, ah, it's because I got you know, whatever you may have. They will just won't call you because they don't want to even play with that, um, that risk of a lawsuit. So, so don't mention your patient if you are. All right, so um, after you have attached this fabulous cover letter that you've written with passion about the things that you like about the company because you've targeted this company and you've done your homework, now you send it to them. And this is the part that people kind of roll their eyes about because we are talking about redundancy here. You want to make sure that you try to get that letter in the hands of the decision makers any way you can. So first and most obvious, you're going to put it in an envelope and you're going to send it to the principal, the visionary, the person who started the company, so that they receive it with their mail and they open it. That is the most reliable way we have to get it in their hands, right? You're going to do that same thing, but you're going to send it attention to HR. And if you can figure out who the HR person is, if they even have one, you know, more power to you, right? You know, you could even call them up and say, hey, let's name your HR person. Okay, thanks. <laughs> you know, and then, and then write it down and say, like, now you do it because you've done your reconnaissance. So now you've sent them two letters, right? You've sent one to the principal, one, one to the HR person. Oh, but, you know, they may not like paper, right? And so now you want to do that same thing via email. So if you can find the emails of the principal, um, that's really great too. It's amazing how many uh, principals have got their emails public because they spoke at some event or, or they're, on, um, they're on an email uh, list that's, that's online or you know, who knows. So search them out, Sur search out their name and the word email and see if you can find it uh, easily that way. Uh, similarly, if you can, um, when you're on your phones, you know, kind of sneakily calling them, you know, ask for the HR person's email address, and they 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 will likely not give it to you, and they'll say, oh, please submit your resume via our website. Thank you. And but you know, maybe the you know maybe you've got somebody covering for the receptionist who's who's actually usually rolling joints. You're like, oh man, her not, her address is boom, and you're like, thank you, boom. You know. Take advantage of the chaos in the system to your own advantage, right? <laughs> and so and so. So now, so now you, you, you've, you've sent this four different ways, or two ways, you know, you've sent it to, via mail, you sent it via the internet to two different people, and now you're going to drop it off in person. So most of these, you know, they, they may not have facilities that you can tour or get into, but most of them have got a front door that you can open and startle the hell out of everybody <laughs> that they've got walk-in traffic. And so, you know, print it up on a decent printer, put it in an envelope, and, 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 and drop it off, I always suggest putting the visionary's name on it, again. Um, I probably wouldn't drop off two, not one for the visionary and one for the HR, just, just put the visionary's name on it, because chances are the reception is going to open it anyway. But now, now you know that, boom, you made sure you delivered it themselves. Now, um, some of the pushback I get from some folks about this is that, you know, that redundancy is going to annoy them, right? Because if you're successful, they've now gotten five communications from you that you want a job from them. Yeah, in this many, in this amount of the time, that might work against you. But 
Number one, chances are they're not going to get all five communications from you. They're either going to not see the emails, or it's going to come in the mail and end up on somebody's desk and forgotten, or you know they're going to get the one that you handed them at the front door, and they're going to take it with them to lunch, and then it's going to get lost in their car. Chances are they're not going to get. You're not going to successfully ping them five times. You know maybe they'll see two of them, maybe they'll see three of them, but. You are only in the game if they see your resume. And then sometimes, you know, they say, you know, a, a brand doesn't really sit with you until you've encountered it three times, and then maybe you'll make a purchase. Same goes for getting a job. The first time the visionary sees your um, your uh, resume, they may not even read it. And the second time they're like, man, this person's insistent. And then the third time they actually read it, and they're like, that's a damn good cover letter. You know, I can feel their passion. Let's look at their work experience. Yeah, man, this works. So this person likes my company. They like what I did with it. And they seem like they're passionate. They'd be like, kind of cool to have around the office. Call them in for an interview. Bam. Right? That's what we're, that is the goal of what we're trying to do. Get that interview. And, and the way you can do that best is by doing everything you can to get the resume in the decision maker's hands. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. Then finally, um, uh, I suggest following calling in a week and asking to talk to the principal, the visionary, the HR person, and see if you can get somebody live on the phone. Um, you know, you're, you're calling to follow up to make sure they got your resume. And you know, you know damn well they did because you sent it five different ways, right? Um, but this creates an opportunity for them to say to you, oh yeah, we did get it, that was pretty great. I was supposed to call you and set up an interview. I'm so glad you called me. You are making that person's job easier. And that's what we want to do. We want to do everything we can to make their job so easy to hire us. So really, your job is to get your resume in the hands of the decision maker. And you know, that makes it, it gives you kind of a whole different thing than, oh, my job is to get a job. Well, yeah, that is, but you need to break that out. Your job is to target 10, do your homework, send it to them redundantly, and follow up, and make that opportunity where they ask you to come in for the interview. I'm assuming that your passion and your interest and your skill set is going to shine when you're in your interview, but, but you need to get to that point first. So, so you know, when you are done, you will have 10 really great resumes with awesome and passion cover letters in the hands of 10 different companies. And I'll tell you something, you are going to be ahead of everybody who's not in this room, right? Nobody's doing this. No, people, you know, even in this room, there's a lot of folks who are gonna hear the strategy and then not do it because they just, they don't have the fire to do it, right? But, but if you do it, you will be in the you know top two or three percent of people who are looking for a job in cannabis, and that's that's really all you need is you need to have something that the other people are not doing, and this strategy is it. So, why does this work so well? So, having a plan on how you are going to get a job is more than just anybody else has got. Having this plan, working the plan, working it through to the end. Um, is is uh, you know implementing your own secret to success, and you know when when you're sitting there in the interview and you're talking to the HR person or to the principal, and they're all they're all like smiling because they got three copies of your resume and and they read your letter, and they're like, man, you really targeted us, you know, you're you're here because we read the thing, and you're thinking to yourself. I did that for nine other companies too, but we're not going to talk about that. But what they're seeing, they're seeing your excitement that you you can get things done, that you've got follow through, you've got passion, you've got you know a plan. You're going to make an awesome employee. You know that interview's already half done. They just want to make sure that you're not like a serial killer at that point. And and so good luck with that part. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I want to also say, you know, yeah, go ahead and apply for the other jobs that people are applying for too, right? Because I'm not a big fan of, you know, keeping all of one's eggs in, in a single basket, you know? Um, you know, apply for the jobs where they are listed, you know, they're listed on monster.com or Craigslist or whatever. But that's not really one where you want to sp spend the most of your time. You want to do this kind of a plan where you are being assertive and you're going after the job you want, right? Because like the jobs that are listed on Craigslist, those are the jobs that are available and you're like, well, I guess I could take it to get my foot in the door. And you might need to take a job to get your foot in the door anyway. But how much cooler is it to go to a company that you already want to work for and apply for a job that you want to do 
instead of just taking you know the low hanging fruit of what's on Craigslist and, and doing well, I, you know, I guess I could do that. Like, but aim higher, and then and then if, if you if you get a lower job, you know, be grateful for that gig, and then and then get that experience and start you know maybe buying another company and then do this. So there are so many jobs that are not advertised. People don't realize that the majority of the jobs are not advertised. Um, so here are some examples. So no one has time to write or post the job listing. Oh my god, this is so common. They're all startups. You know, there's probably not a dedicated HR person. No one likes hiring staff, except maybe me. And, uh, and so when you are, uh, uh, when you are taking uh, the initiative, you have solved the challenge they have of no one wanting to write the damn ad. They also have a, they have a job posted somewhere, but you have not seen it, right? So, so maybe you're looking at all the common places, but you know whoever is doing the thing, they're using their brother-in-law's, you know, employment website that none of us have heard of, right? And they're like, well, we got the job posted, we're not sure why we haven't gotten any resumes in yet, and and so so suddenly they get yours in. And they're like, booyah, you know, we got our one person, let's interview them, right? And so there's that possibility. Um, they are about to let someone go. This happens all the time. You talk to 502 owners, they all got that one employee that they're like, uh, you know, I would love to get rid of them, but I don't have time to write the ad. And, and they just don't have the, they're just not ready to let them go. But they would really like to. It's like, give me a reason to let them go, you know? And sometimes it's because they like, you know, break something severe or something. And they're like, okay, I got my reason. But maybe the reason could just be that you showed up. And so you are causing the impetus to create room for yourself. So maybe they have an employee they don't like, but they've not decided to let them go yet. And they haven't even really thought about letting them go, but they just don't like them. And you, they get your resume that says, I like you, I like your company, I'm badass at what you need to hire me for, let's do this. And they're like, oh, you know what? I didn't like this other employee, but I didn't realize that there was an alternative until you gave them the alternative. You're creating these opportunities that didn't exist before for them to hire you. Also, they need help, but they've not really thought about hiring somebody. Well, you know, they've got their tight team of five people. This is how they've done it for the last eight months. And they've been working their butts off, but it never really occurred to them, well, you know, you can make your life a lot easier if you hired another person. And, you know, a lot of these companies don't actually have, um, you know, a lot of budget to hire another person. But, you know, the, the, the amount of cannabis being sold is going up and up every month. These companies that have not been um, in the black are now starting to get in the black. And maybe it hadn't occurred to them, you know what, maybe we should hire somebody. And maybe they don't have an ad out, but when they read your cover letter, they're like, well, I think it's time to hire somebody. And then my favorite is the last one, and this is how I've gotten the majority of my jobs in my life, and definitely all the kick-ass jobs I've got. It's that you win. The visionary gets their hands on your resume, they read it, and they're like, hell yes. This person gets me. They get the company. They get what we want to do. I'm going to make a job for them. And it's, you know, I've, this probably happened eight or nine times in my life. It happens all the time. And then after, you know, I'm always asked to um, speak to my friend's kids about this, this strategy. <laughs> and I hear back from them, it's like, oh. You know, so-and-so uh, snowboarding company, they weren't even hiring, but then when they got my, my, my resume that said, you know, I'm a snowboarder and I love their company and that I, I've been to, um, you know, competitions and I've rooted for their teams and, and, like, they asked me in for an interview and they made a job for me. I mean, I'm delivering mail, but I'm in at Burton or wherever, right? You know, this could be you. Um, the idea of being able to have, reach the visionary who can very literally with a, yeah, yeah, bring them in for an interview, create a job for you, there's a lot of power in reaching that person. And it happens all of the time. So two, four, six. So there's, there are six different ways that a job could exist for you that is not advertised and the company who's hiring you doesn't even know they need you yet. Um, this is why the strategy works. So your odds are also way up because no one else is applying for a job this way. And chances are they may not even be getting very many resumes. 
because a lot of folks take the take the low road. You know, they, they respond to the the Craigslist jobs, and you know they send those. They'll come to something like this because they're like, oh, I can I can get up and go and, and be there for a few hours on Sunday. But not a lot of people are putting in the effort to target companies and go to the kind of work that we're talking about doing. And honestly, you know, the strategy I'm talking about, this is not a lot of work, right? You can do most of this in an afternoon. You just have to like stay focused and not let yourself get distracted and you know stay sober enough to do it. And um, and, and you know, the, the time commitment is not a lot. What it is, it's it's the heart commitment. That's a lot. And, and that's why I'm talking about getting a job in cannabis with your passion today, right? This is not this is not luck. This is you activating your passion to get something done because um, you've got clear intent. And that clear intent will come through your cover letter and it will just explode all over the floor in your interview and you'll have a job. So cannabis jobs are a game of odds. You know, by, by targeting the company that you want versus taking the ones that are applying, you are increasing your odds of getting a job. Um, by writing your great cover letter, you're increasing your odds. And then by being redundant and getting to them, you're increasing your odds. And, and there, if you are serious about doing this, increasing your odds and decreasing your risk is how you want to play this game. And, and you're going to be the only person in the room doing that uh, for them. So, I mean, I've seen this work time and time again, both for myself and for people that I work with and for, for folks that I consult for. And it's really amazing because that now I know so many people who, who own cannabis businesses. And, and so many of the visionaries, they feel like people um, don't hear them. Um, they, they, they don't understand their vision anymore and they're all stuck with the day-to-day -day operations BS stuff. And they're not getting to necessarily do all of the, the passionate stuff that they kind of envisioned at the beginning. Because in the end, you know, the fantasy of working in cannabis or the fantasy of starting a job in cannabis is very much unlike going to work every day, especially if it's every day. You know, like if you're the visionary, you're working seven days a week. And to have your resume come in where you are speaking the secret language of why what they're doing is cool, people respond to that in a very serious way. So, that's the strategy. Um, I suggest that you do each step do it today. Do not put this off and follow through because just sending them the resume may not be enough without you following up and call. Um, so I'm, I've got a little bit extra time, so I'll take like three questions if anybody's got some questions for me. Yes, Dave. Uh, you, you list 10 companies. Now I live in Bellingham and there might be four. Mm -hmm. um, I would send resumes down here but you know, moving down to this area is very expensive, mm -hmm. and they probably wouldn't want to be my salary. Right on, that's a really good point. So Dave says, what if there are not 10 cannabis companies within your area to commute? And you know, when I talk about this in other industries, what I recommend people do is you, you, you take, a, you take a, a, a map, and you kind of draw an outline of where you're willing to commute, and then you find companies within that area that you think are cool. Now, now that works a lot easier when it's not just one industry, if you've got more flexibility in your industry. But since we're talking about only cannabis, what Dave's talking about is, is correct, especially if you live in a, in a county with a moratorium, right? So in that case, um, so Dave's saying that there's, there's only four cannabis companies that, that are close enough to, to commute to, and I would say just write them even better for those four, you know? <laughs> to target what you can. You know, if they don't exist yet, um, you can't write to them. But, you know, as part of doing the, the R&D to get the job, um, you know, watch for new companies to, you know, um, you, you, can, you can see the, uh, the, the, the landscape usage boards that go up before they set up shop, you know, and you, you know, write to them before they even exist as a company. But you're right, you know, the fact that the, the, the cannabis companies are not evenly distributed around the state means that anybody in, you know, King County generally is in a way better position than somebody who's like way north, you know, near the Canadian border. Another sub-question is this, how about finding out who the, um Visionaries are by going to your local pot store and where you buy your ounces or your. Yeah, there, there's a there's a lot of creative ways to find out who the visionary is. You know, you can you can find out who they are by uh, you know looking at uh, interviews that they may have done in Dope Magazine or Northwest Leaf. Um, Google their name. Look at their uh, you know search the company name in a LinkedIn. Right. 
Um, you can even call that same receptionist that gave you the HR person's email address. Maybe they'll, you know, you can say, oh, you know, I'm calling. What, what's the name of the person who founded the company? And they'll probably give it to you pretty easily. So just, just be, you know, a little, little creative about it. It's not really hard. A lot, of, most of these visionaries, um, you know, have got a nice dose of ego, um, which you need to run a company. And because of that, they're usually somewhere, you know, out and about talking about how badass their company is anyway. Another question? Yeah. Um, what is your best advice for somebody that's trying to start their own business? Like they did What is your best advice? My best advice for somebody who wants to start their own cannabis company is to do something that does not require a license. Um, the hardest companies to run are the ones that are licensed by the state. Um, it's, what did you say? Marijuana. Correct, because you don't, you know, you need to get certified by the state, but you don't necessarily have to be to get a license. The hoops that you have to go through to obtain your processor license or your grower's license or God help you, a retail store, and, and just to have, you know, where you live, have a moratorium, the regulations are so ugly in Washington and the opportunities are so rich in corollary industries. You know, maybe you're going to invent like the new super cool bomb. Or you're, or you're going, you know, you want to do a lifestyle brand and put out clothes. Or you've got, you know, like, like the hemp wicks. Like who knew there was an industry in hemp wicks, right? But there's a couple really great companies that are making money that, I mean, um, it, it, you know, invent something really cool that dabbers are going to love, right? You know, dabbers have got so much discretionary income to be able to buy the things of their passion. They will buy your cool invention. And so... Um, and so similarly with services, right? Maybe maybe you are an accountant at REI or like a bookkeeper at REI, and you're like you love your you know you love REI and stuff, but you want to do something a little more edgy. Well, maybe you start a, um, a service firm that specializes in catering to the cannabis industry, and now suddenly you know you're the you're the first person that does your specialty for only cannabis clients, right? And maybe you're doing that while you're still working at REI. You're doing this you know one day a week or something. So, so that, that would be my best recommendation is to um, find something that you're excited about, that you are, are willing to sell, and uh, to try to stay out of anything that requires a license at this point. One more question. Yes? How about you've had the interview, you've taken in your application, had the interview, you get the call back that they're not moving forward at this time. But that is a company you really want to work for. What's appropriate at that stage? Right on. Let's, let's answer that question a couple ways. So she's, she's asking, well, what happens if you have your interview and then they say, no thanks? Um, so the first thing would be, um, if you really want that company, um, apply again in six months. And um, you know, you know, three months is a little bit on the fast side. Um, they might decide that you're an irritant and you don't really want that. But definitely six months. I mean, all these companies, they radically change every couple months. So in six months, you know, the person in HR who interviewed you may not even be there anymore, right? And so, um, and, and their needs, and maybe they just got another round of financing, so now they can hire a lot more people. So, so that's number one. Go back to the same company that you're all juiced about in six months. But more to your, your question, um, wait, what was the specific part of your question? Well, that, that's your answer. Oh, yeah. all right, all right. What, what, what do you do next? I want to work there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so do that. Oh, I remember. And then the second part is go look for a job at a different company. Don't sweat it, right? Because, except for maybe where Dave lives where there's only four companies, <laughs> there's lots of cannabis companies where we're generally, you know, like here we're in the Seattle land area, right? And so um, so just, you know, don't, don't get too bummed out. And I mean, I certainly have got like two or three brands in the state that I think are super cool. And then if I was looking for a job, I would go there. And if they told me no, I'd be like crestfallen. But the game is not to only be able to get a job with Solstice, right? The game is to get a job in cannabis, period. So if you interview with the super cool cool and they're not ready for you, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or you're not ever going to be able to work with them. It means it's not the right fit right now. So go back to them in six months. And in the meantime, shift to somebody else on your list. So um, if you are into this kind of idea, you can um, find out more of the kind of stuff like this by uh, listening to my podcast, Shaping Fire. You can get on that list at shapingfire.com. Um, and also you can uh, contact me through my website at shangolos.com. 
And uh, I think that's it. Um, I'm going to be around for a while. Oh, let me plug some other things that are going on here today as well. Um, at 2 o'clock, we're going to have a panel right here um, with some uh, live cannabis business owners. And we're going to talk about their preferences. We're going to talk to somebody who is um, hiring for sales, somebody who's hiring uh, as a processor, um, a, a serial uh, job applicant. And, and we've got, we're going to have a visionary here in the flesh to kind of uh, you know, um, uh, confirm what I've been saying to you. And then also, um, if you are the kind of person who wants to attach a headshot, we actually have got somebody taking um, headshots for 25 bucks. So, you know, um, hopefully you dressed appropriately today and you've got your smile on. So anyway, I'm around if you want to talk to me. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.